Welcome to the presentation on binding and affinity. One of the overall themes in this course is that function depends on structure, and vice versa. Now, what does this mean? What makes cells different from each other, and what are the chemical, genetic, and cellular mechanisms underlying cell uniqueness? These are the questions that we'll try to answer in this presentation. A cell's uniqueness differentiates cells not only across different species, such as between monkeys and humans, but also within the same species. This is due to differences in gene expression and the proteins that they produce. As one can imagine, the activity of these expressed products, such as proteins and enzymes, are tightly regulated. These differences can distinguish cells that occupy the same environment, such as muscles and nerves, where nerves provide neurotransmitters for the muscles to contract. It's important to realize that cells have different functions and that it is activity of the cellular components that give rise to cell function, which is dictated by its structure. One great example of structure specificity dictating function is our immune system. Our immune system recognizes parts of whole cells and has the ability to distinguish self from non-self, such as our DNA versus foreign DNA. If the immune system finds non-self cells, it will latch on and destroy it. This brings us to the concept of binding between molecules and cells. The strength at which a molecule binds to another is its affinity. The stronger the bond, the stronger the affinity. The lecture compares this to Velcro, where the more overlap there are between the layers, the stronger the bond. Also important is the concept of specificity. The immune system has antibodies, which may bind to particular foreign bodies called antigens, and this must be extremely specific. And here you can see the structure of an antibody, which will be covered in detail in a later lecture. This lecture covers two kinds of immunities, innate and acquired. Innate immunity is the first line of defense for the immune system. This includes the skin, which is a physical shield against foreign bodies, low pH, and stomach acid, as well as the cough reflex. The second type is acquired immunity, an additional level of immunity which is where our lymphocytes are activated to create antibodies and cytokines, which recognize specific antigens to bind to, destroy, and remember. This is much slower and is demonstrated when, when we receive vaccination shots. You can read about the examples of vaccinations against smallpox and cowpox in the lecture, but now I'd like to go over the main take-home message of this lecture, which is understanding mathematically the binding between an antigen and an antibody. This can be described like any non-covalent chemical reaction between molecules. Let's use an example of a ligand and a receptor, and here we can look at the chemical equations for the association and dissociation of a receptor to its ligand. RL indicates when the receptor and ligand are binded together, while R and L indicate non-binded or free receptors or ligands. On the right, we can see the dissociation and association constant, which are called KD and KA. These constants tell us about the affinity between the re receptor and ligand. If KD, the dissociation constant, is large, then the receptor and ligand is more likely to separate. If KD is small, it indicates a strong bond between the receptor and ligand. And this is similar for the associ association constant Ka. If Ka is large, then there's a stronger bond, while if Ka is small, the ligand and receptor don't want to bind together. It's worthwhile to talk about the equilibrium point, which is the point at which the rates of binding and unbinding are equal. Because of this, we can write out DRL DT, or the change in RL to be zero, which can be equated to the difference in association and dissociation rate. Note that the association rate equals Ka times R times L, and dissociation rate equals Kd times Rl, which is not the same as Ka and Kd by themselves. Also note that the equilibrium constant is defined as the concentration of receptor bound to ligand divided by the concentration of free receptor multiplied by concentration of free ligand. This constant is also defined by Ka divided by Kd. So how do we measure Kd? We can use a semi-permeable membrane. It's semi-permeable in that it allows smaller molecules, ligands, to flow back and forth, but not larger molecules, such as receptors, which can only stay on one side. It doesn't matter where you start the ligands on, the opposite side from the receptors, the same side, or just mixed around, because the same concentration will result once equilibrium is reached. The more ligands there are at equilibrium, that means the ligands and receptors don't bind as well, so Kd is higher. 
On the other hand, lower values of KD indicate a tighter affinity between the two molecules. The last thing we are going to cover is specificity, or how a receptor binds to a particular ligand versus another. Here's a great example of an immunogen compared to a bunch of test antigens. This immunogen has produced specific antibodies which were then tested against these molecules to measure for KD. Remember that a lower KD means a higher affinity, so it makes sense that haptin, which is a test molecule here that is closest to the original immunogen structurally, has the lowest KD value of 50 nanomolars. The bottom molecule, on the other hand, is not nearly as close structurally, so its KD with the corresponding antibodies is very high. And this demonstrates the concept of specificity, as we can see that look, by looking at the KD values, the antibody will bind better to a particular molecule, in this case, molecules that have structures which are close to the original immunogen. To summarize, the important theme of this lecture is the relationship between structure and function, which is especially important in our immune system. In this example, antibodies bind best to antigens with a specific shape. To understand specificity, we use the chemical relationship between a ligand and a receptor. We went over the concepts of KD and KA, as well as using a semi-permeable membrane to determine KD. Also, remember how to determine the equilibrium constant, which is shown here.